I want to welcome you to the abundant childhood, nature, creativity, and health. We're excited about the opportunity to spend an evening with internationally acclaimed author Richard Louvre. This event's part of the Spirit and Place Civic Festival, whose theme this year is Living Generously. Please welcome the author of Last Child in the Woods, Saving Our Children from Nature Deficit Disorder, Richard Louvre. Thank you, Jim. I really want to uh, thank all the people who generously uh, have given me their time and their, their attention over the last uh, day and a half. You've got wonderful people here. This is just a, a, great, uh, a great place. One of the things I tell my sons is that um, who have come, on, come with me on a couple of these trips uh, they, I, I tell them about the kind of people who are attracted to this issue, and they didn't believe me until they came with me. And both of them kind of were stunned at how nice the people were that I was speaking to. I said, that's what I've been telling you. These are great people. There's something about this issue that really attracts really, really nice and good people. Um, I, when uh, uh, Wayne Zink I, I met a little while ago, and I told him a story that I think he had kind of ha heard before, but um, it has to do with what he sells. Uh, when uh, my, son, my younger son and I, my younger son, Matthew, is the more uh, outdoorsy guy. The older son, uh, Jason, I just saw last week, he lives in New York and he works for a green advertising company. But he's, he's a very urban kind of guy. My younger son, Matthew, I knew he had the fishing gene when he was three because I caught him fishing in the humidifier. <laughs> uh, and th for a couple summers, we went up to Kodiak, Alaska and went fly fishing there for uh, uh, a week and a half or so each time. And the second time, both times, we had close encounters with big bears and uh, uh, big Alaska brown bears, the, the kind that, you know, have people for dessert. And uh, uh, the second time we were going up the stream, a close stream. Usually the summer before we'd fished mainly out in the open in the bigger, uh, the bigger streams. And this one was a small stream that went up to the uh, up into the into the forest. And it, this is where the salmon end up dying, and that's Bear Kitchen. That's where they go to eat. And the thing about this is that the the bushes are right there. And the stream is narrow, and it's thick forest. And so you don't know if the bear is there. And the thing about these bears is you wear bells. Sometimes they're called bear tums. Uh, but uh, you make a lot of noise. You sing. You talk. You just constantly are doing that because you, what you don't want to do is surprise the bears by coming around a corner, and there, there it is. Um, so we were going up the stream. And the guide that was with us taught us how to smell for bears. We had, didn't know we were supposed to smell for bears. Uh, and once you've smelled this, you, you never forget it. It's kind of a, a mixture of musk and uh, rotten salmon because they like to roll in the salmon. Uh, but it's a very distinctive smell. And so if you smell that when you're going up that stream, that means one of two things. Either the bear is right there or the bear is just left right there. You can't tell, but it's, so what do you do? You sing louder. Um, uh, I, you know, the, my, my son's comment was that it sure beats high school uh, <laughs> in terms of learning. You know, all of the senses are alive. All of the senses are attuned and working at the same time. That, I mean, other than a New York subway, when else does that happen than we go, when we go out in the woods, when we go out into nature? It doesn't, you don't have to have bears there to have that happen, but certainly it helps. Um, uh, I learned about a study that was released last year at the University of California at Berkeley that discovered that as human beings, we have great noses. We can smell things that we don't know. We, we can track through the use of our nose, and we don't know that. We've lost that 
knowledge, not the ability, but the knowledge that we have that ability. And the, the, the way they did this experiment, they took graduate students, of course, uh, uh, and they, had, they put earmuffs on them and, and, and masks so they couldn't see or hear. So it was blocked. They, they made them get down in the grass in a field. And then they had them follow a trail with their nose. And they went and they went and they went and they knew exactly when to turn. And they could do this. Of course, it helped, and this is where Wayne Zink comes in, it helped that what the, uh, what the trail was was chocolate. <laughs> so I'm not sure if that study counts, but, but uh, I like to tell that story because it really in- illustrates, you know, the kind of the generosity of nature, the generosity of, of our bodies, of our being in the world that we so often overlook uh, because we have our iPod uh, in. Uh, I like to talk to kids about the end pod, the nature pod, you know, to open up your senses, to really be there, to really be there. And this is, this is what we're losing in society as we spend more and more time with screen time instead of stream time. I'm not against technology. I love, uh, in fact, I better turn it off. I love uh, my trio and I love uh, my Macintosh too much. Uh, they're great. But it's a sense of balance that we're looking for. I'm not uh, somebody who who beats up on parents for letting their kids watch TV or play video games. Um, It's part of the culture. But what we have to do now is be very intentional about how we use our time and what we allow ourselves to be open to. To me, the, the bear on that stream symbolizes nature. I'm not romanticizing nature. Nature is dangerous. But in nature, you know, the bears are global warming. The bears are, uh, you know, Katrina. But these have their lessons for us. These have meaning. And when we are fully aware of nature, both in what it can do to us and what it can do for us, we are far more fully alive. And we have to allow our children that knowledge, that experience. It's not the facts, it's the experience. Um, Just um, briefly, I grew up outside of Kansas City. Where I grew up looked a lot like this. And I lived on the very edge of um, suburbia. And I could go out my back door uh, as an eight-year-old and through the yard and then through the uh, a hedge, and from there into uh, the cornfield where my underground fort was, and then from there on into the woods and the farms that seemed to go on forever. Those were my woods. I owned those woods. Those woods were in my heart. Those woods are in my heart today. I go to those woods sometimes in my heart. And I imagine that those of you who are here tonight, if you're old enough to have had this experience, because younger pe- people often have not had this experience, uh, you have that place in your heart that you go to sometimes too. Maybe it's a woods or a field, a stream, a beach. Some place you go that still exists in your heart that special place in nature. Maria Montessori said that in nature, children find their strength. Uh, I still go to that place to find my strength sometimes or a sense of peace. And I'll bet you do too. Uh, The question, it seems to me, that we now face as a kind of companion issue or bookend issue to global warming, because we can't do much about one without doing something about the other, is will future generations have that place to go to in their heart? Um, There is a, a really a giant gap opening up between children and nature. One could make the case it began with agriculture, it speeded up with the Industrial Revolution. 
But within the last 30 years, in particular, at an accelerating pace, when you look at some of the statistics, the last five years in particular, this pace has been very quick. Even in places where there's a lot of nature, kids aren't going outside very much. One little boy told me that the reason he preferred playing indoors because that's where all the electrical outlets are. <laughs> and I heard that from kids all over the country. Now, I will tell you that I don't use uh, terms like couch potato. I don't use those words, those pejorative terms, because I think that these kids are good kids. I think they're following orders. I think they're doing what the culture is telling them to do. And so are the parents. Uh, the message that is coming to these kids and to us as parents from so many directions, even from some unexpected directions, even in the past from environmental organizations sometimes, but certainly from television, sometimes from education, is that nature's in the past probably doesn't matter anymore. Uh, the future is in electronics. The boogeyman lives in the woods. And playing outside is possibly uh, probably illicit and possibly illegal. And I mean that literally. When you begin to look at the kinds of places that we're living, the kinds of developments, in the last 35 years, almost all new housing uh, developments built in the United States are covered by covenants and restrictions, these CCNRs, um, which are enforced in varying degree, but they all send the same message often. If you look at the fine print, in these communities, just try to put up a basketball hoop in some of them, let alone let the kids go outside and build a treehouse or a fort. One woman uh, came up to me right after the book came out and said that her community association had recently outlawed chalk drawing on the sidewalks, which leads to cocaine. <laughs> and, you know, our schools, now I hope this isn't happening here, but the schools, even as they hand out brochures to parents about child obesity, in Broward County, Florida, this big school district there last year started putting up no running signs on the playgrounds. <laughs> this is happening all over the country. You know, we're, we're, we're outlawing tag. Um, uh, we're, we're dropping recess or cutting drastically back on about 40% of school districts have done one or the other with recess. Uh, field trips in many schools, I hope that's not happening here. Field trips in many school districts are a thing of the past because there's so much focus on testing. I understand, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, good intentions behind that, but, you know, I think that a kind of management ethic that was let loose in the 80s and 90s during the time of uh, re uh, acquisitions and mergers has taken hold in our country, even of education. And the basic mantra is that only that which can be counted counts. And I think that that mantra has taken over education. It's taken over so much of our lives. Um, when you look at the, uh, and by the way, uh, Albert Einstein had a sign on his door that said, uh, some things that count cannot be counted, and some things that can be counted count. Um, or cannot be counted, you get the picture. <laughs> you know, can compassion be counted? Can that sense that my son had going up that stream in Alaska, can that be measured, can that be counted? Well, it turns out in some ways it can. In some ways it can, but the question is, are we listening to this new body of information? Even as we're realizing, and I can get into some of the detail on how we know and the extent to which this uh, division between children and nature has occurred, even as we're become, becoming aware of that, this new body of evidence, which began uh, quite a while ago, decades ago, there were a few pioneers, but in the last dozen years it's really accelerated, is showing us that um, the uh, abundance in, <laughs> that nature brings our kids and the generosity that it has for them uh, is perhaps essential to healthy child development. Now, a child can get through childhood and turn out just fine without nature. 
But when you begin to look at these studies, you say, how, why would we deny this to anybody, to any child? At the University of Illinois, ongoing set of studies show that children with just a little bit of contact with nature, if they have the symptoms of attention deficit disorder, those symptoms get better very quickly, even kids as young as five years old. Uh, the people doing those studies suggest that uh, nature therapy be added as a third therapy to, for kids with those symptoms of attention deficit disorder. The other two traditional therapies being behavioral modification and uh, Ritalin and other stimulants. Now I'll say very clearly that personally, I'm not a radical on this. I think that some kids you know, do need medication, but how many? The huge increase in the number of kids being diagnosed with these symptoms, the huge increase with the number of kids being handed pills, the huge increase, not only of Ritalin, but the huge increase in the number of kids being handed antidepressants, even as young as preschool, and we now know that's very bad for them, the huge increase or the increase in, 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 in teenage suicide, could these things have something to do with the fact that we've taken the calming effect of nature away from kids in the first place? Uh, over 100 studies of adults and children show that nature has a profoundly good effect on stress, on lowering the bad stress. Just a walk in the woods, just a little bit, works wonderfully for kids and for adults. I, I recently... Uh, um, Clint Eastwood recently had um, a conference in Carmel that he asked me to come to, and, and some of us were taking bets on how long it would be until somebody said, make my day. <laughs> it happened within about 15 seconds. Um, uh, but he brought developers, the 25 biggest developers in California together to ha spend a day talking about you know, having a workshop. How can we build developments in the future that actually connect kids to nature? But there was a psychiatrist, a child and adolescent psychiatrist there who spoke, and he said that um, he's not using nature directly in his practice now, but that the book had changed his practice. What he does now is these kids that come in for treatment, the first thing he does is take them for a walk along the Sacramento River. And he says, when they get back, then they are ready for therapy. Um, one of the really good things that has happened recently is that the, just two weeks ago, the uh, Nation's Health, which is the official newspaper of the American Public Health Association, had a front page story and a big full page jump um, about the children in nature movement that's, that has emerged in the last couple of years. It's a great story. It's very complimentary. This is a big, this is a big step. Because the medical community will often say, "Well, where's all the longitudinal studies, the three-decade studies?" And I say to them, "Where were you 30 years ago? Why didn't you start them?" You know, this area, this this is so understudied, all of this, um, and there are reasons during the Q&A uh, session. Maybe we can talk about why that is. I have some ideas about that. But it's very understudied. But now the nation's health, the American Public Health Association, is, is saying the same thing, same thing that Howard Frumkin, who's the head of the uh, Center for Environmental Health for the Centers for Disease Control, says, which is, yes, we need more research, but we know enough to act. Um, just as an illustration on the uh, on the, uh, the thing I was talking about, attention deficit disorder, I was in a um, in a hotel room in San Francisco a few weeks ago, and I picked up uh, a magazine, one of those magazines you wonder where they come from, in the hotel room, and I was reading, and I looked at the back page, and there's this wonderful photograph on the back page, black and white photograph, and it was a kid on a beach. And he was running along, he looked like five, six years old, and he's running along the beach and his hands were outstretched. Behind him are the gray waves coming in, it looked like a California beach. And behind that was the storm clouds. And he was racing along with his hands outstretched and his eyes were filled with life. And the story talked about how this little boy had a problem. He had the wiggles. He couldn't sit still in class. He was disruptive. The school kicked him out. 
of the story next to the photograph said that his parents didn't know what to do, but his parents had been good and had observant parents, and they had seen how nature experienced help their little boy focus and be more calm. So for the next 10 years, they took him all over the West to all the great uh, wild places of the West, and the little boy turned out okay. The photograph was taken in 1906, and the little boy was Ansel Adams. Now, the question is, what would have happened to little Ansel if he had been placed on Ritalin and placed in a cubicle and expected not to move? Again, I'm not a, a lot of kids do need medication, but how many? How many little Ansels and Anselettes are out there right now who have enormous talent, who have enormous vision, who can give us great gifts in the future if only we give them nature? Um, other studies of creativity show that how kids play, they've looked at how kids play in uh, a natural play area compared to the flat uh, asphalt or turf uh, playground. The kids in the natural play areas are far more likely to invent their own games, far more likely to play cooperatively. It's interesting because organized sports for kids is marketed as a way to build teamwork in your kids, and it's true. But any of us who remember building a treehouse with our buddies or damming the little ditch in front of our house, hoping that we would flood the neighborhood. Um, we remember what that was like. We remember that teamwork that just kind of happened. Uh, the leaders that emerge in these two types of environments are very different. The leaders who emerge in the flat, turf, or cement playgrounds are the physically strongest. The leaders who emerge in the natural play areas with green trees and bushes, those are the smartest kids, which makes sense. They're in making up their own games. Now, increasingly, you will hear from teachers that they're troubled by students who cannot seem to visualize things outside themselves. One teacher that I met actually set up a television in the front of the class and covered it with a black cloth and had kids sit there and look at it in order to begin to imagine. I've heard this from a lot of teachers. I've also heard from teachers and parents all over the country again and again and again how different Johnny or Judy is when Johnny or Judy goes outside, particularly into nature. And suddenly that troublemaker is the leader. And yet, what are we doing? We're closing down playgrounds. Now, at some schools, and I hope there are some here, and certainly, you know, the, uh, uh, the park here, uh, the, the people who have brought me here, are working on such wonderful uh, ways, partnerships with schools, to get those kids out into nature. We need to do that. We need to do much, much more of that. Um, but the, the studies go on. The cognitive development in the 1990s, uh, kids in schools that had some kind of uh, outdoor classroom, they were tested all over the country. Those kids did better across the board from social studies to standardized testing, to standardized testing. The study two years ago in California, California Department of, of Education, looked at three school districts that still had an immersion program in nature. The kids in those programs, like a sixth grade camp, those kids did 27% better on science testing than the kids in the typical classroom. We have the evidence, just as we had the evidence for music and art and their effect on learning, the fact that learning music helps with math. We knew that. And yet what did we do? We flooded the schools with more computers, which you know are out of date in, in a year and a half. Computers are good, computers are fine, but there's actually not a whole lot of evidence that computers in the classroom are all that great as teaching tools. We were talking earlier, it's kind of like PowerPoint, you know. 
I, I, I don't use power, as you notice, I don't use PowerPoint. And many of the speeches, people are incredulous, you know, when they hook me up with the mic. They, you don't have PowerPoint? And you can see them kind of short-circuiting, <laughs> you know. I said, no, it gets in the way. This is about eye contact. This is about a conversation. We put up too much information. And the eye doesn't know where to go. And the heart doesn't know where to go. That's similar to how we're overloading our kids with technology. Again, I love technology, but we're overloading them with that. Meanwhile, we're blocking out that trip up the stream and all of the information from the world that will come into a child. When a child or an adult is in that setting and all of the sensors are working at the same time, which does not happen in front of a computer or a television, you're just looking at that screen. You're blocking out the world. But when that happens, that's the optimum state of learning. When you are open, when you are open to what you see and hear and touch and smell. And perhaps when you do that, you sing for the bears. You learn. We need to give that to our children. Um, yeah. Um, let me, uh, let me uh, say, too, in terms of the uh, evidence for this break from nature, and there's a lot more evidence we could talk about later about how great nature is for kids. Um, this is having a profound effect, and people are it noticing it in interesting industries, for instance. Uh, two years ago, the Outdoor Industry Association asked me to give their keynote. They have two big conferences, uh, conventions every uh, year in Salt Lake. These are all the people that make backpacks, REI, et cetera. The reason they asked me to do that is they're, did, do that is they're looking at their numbers, and they're realizing they're selling lots of high-end um, uh, high gear, expensive high-end gear to yuppies and baby boomers that usually stays in the garage with a four-wheel drive. Um, and what they're not selling very much of now is entry-level gear to the extent that some of these companies have stopped making it, which, of course, is self-fulfilling. So they're looking at the numbers and say, will there be an outdoor industry as we know it in 10 or 15 years? Conservation groups have a great stake here. They're looking at their numbers too. One of the biggest conservation groups in the United States, and I won't tell you which one because they made me promise not to, not to tell which one, their average age is 58 years old and getting older fast. They're kind of like newspaper readers. Uh, that's not good news for the future of the environment itself. Um, recently I was in Ukiah, California, or a few months ago, up in the mountains, beautiful place, mist in the trees, wonderful place. The educators there told me the same things they tell me everywhere, which even though nature is right there, the kids are not going out. Um, Ukiah is Spotted Owl Central. Remember the whole Spotted Owl issue? raises an interesting question. Is the spotted owl the leading endangered indicator species, or is it something else? I think if kids are not going outside now and bonding with nature, who in the world will care about the spotted owl or any other endangered species in 10 or 15 years? Yes, there will always be conservationists, environmentalists, but increasingly, unless we turn this around, I believe we can, Nature will be carried in people's briefcases, not in their hearts. It's a very different kind of relationship. Um, as I, and the studies, by the way, show that all, almost to a person, conservationists, environmental, people with an environmental consciousness had some kind of transcendent experience in nature when they were kids. They had a sense that they owned nature and nature owned them. We had that sense if we're lucky enough to have had it, to be that age. I started by talking about my woods, that my sense of ownership, they were my woods. They were so much my woods that as an eight-year-old, uh, I think I pulled out hundreds of survey stakes that I knew had something to do with the <laughs> bulldozers that were taking out other woods. So how many here pulled out survey stakes? Be honest, when you were kids. <laughs> Like, look around. No, come on. Don't be shy. There's a lot of hands. I hereby induct you into the secret society of stake pullers. 
your stakeholders in that society. Uh, I told that story uh, last year in Albuquerque, as I usually do. And this was to a group called the Quivira Coalition, which is a really interesting group in the, in the West that is bringing together ranchers and environmentalists who are sometimes the, the same thing. And they're doing land trust together, et cetera. Uh, afterwards, in the question period, a rancher stood up, and he was the real deal. He was in his 60s. His jeans had not been acid washed. Uh, he had a long white handlebar mustache and sunburn and thick plastic rim glasses. And he says, you know that story you told about pulling out stakes? And I said, yes. And he said, I did that when I was a boy. And then he began to cry in front of 500 people, half of whom were wearing cowboy hats. And despite his deep embarrassment, he continued to talk, to talk about his deep sense of grief that his might be one of the last generations to have that kind of sense of ownership of land. It has nothing to do with money. A little while later, I was signing books, and a young woman in her 40s, a rancher, came up, and she said, you know that story you told about pulling out steaks? And I said, yes. She said, I did that when I was a girl, uh, too, but I did it different. I did it from my horse. And my horse got so used to me pulling out steaks that it started taking me over to the steaks. <laughs> Pull out that steak. But that sense of ownership, that sense of belonging in the world. Um, we have to begin to think about uh, comparative risk in terms of comparative risk. In terms of why this split is happening, just briefly, obviously electronics have something to do with it. You know, they are seductive and distracting and wonderful in many ways. But it's too easy to blame uh, this only on video games, kind of like for those of us who are who are older, remember when Elvis came in and rock and roll, all of our sins were blamed on that. And of course, our sins were not due to rock and roll. Well, maybe some of them. But um, the, the, uh, video games have kind of taken on that mantle now. Yes, they, and, and in fact, the American Medical Association came very close last year to declaring video game addiction an official addiction. Um, so it's an important issue, but it's not the main issue. Access to nature is very important, but you know, if you go to the new edge of Kansas City that looks just like where I grew up, where the kids can go right out that back door and right into the cornfield and into the woods, they're not going, just as they're not going in, in Ukiah. So, you know, it's impossible to go out in the woods if they've been cut down, it's true, but it's not just access. Parents say they're so busy, there's no time for it, and their kids' lives are so overscheduled and their kids are sitting in the back seat. of the, There's actually an ad that shows this, and I've actually seen this in person. Kids sitting in the back seat of the minivan going to the play date. The video screen is flipped down, and they're watching National Geographic specials about nature instead of looking out the window. And they're going to a play date. And just life is just so overorganized for adults, for kids. We feel this. Um, but it's not that either, I don't think entirely. We always make time for the things we value ultimately. I mean, how many of us here are, uh, go to gyms? We find the time. Either that or you're like me and you join a gym and you never go. <laughs> um, so it's not just that. I think that the underbelly of this issue is fear. I think we are living in a state of fear. I think as parents we are just terrified mainly of stranger danger. Now, it's interesting. When you look at the actual statistics, for instance, on stranger abductions, the number is really not that big. One is too many, but it's about 150, 200, around in there a year. It's been steady or gone down for at least two uh, decades. The vast majority of abductions are by family members or somebody the family knows, not by strangers. Uh, there's a study from Duke University that says that violence toward children outside the home has actually dropped about 31%, I believe, in the last uh, either 10 or 15 years. Uh, if those numbers are getting better, actually, what's happening? Why do we feel, why is our perception that uh, stranger danger is, is skyrocketing? Uh, I hold my own profession largely 
to blame. Yes, it's entertainment media, but it's also the news media. I'd like to think it's those electronic guys, not us uh, print guys, but it's us too. But all you have to do, truly, is watch CNN or Fox, and you will see how they take, quite consciously, a handful of terrible crimes against children, and they repeat them over and over and over again. And when they get done telling us about the crime, then they tell us about the trial over and over and over again. And when it's a really slow news week, they go find John Benet Ramsey again. That's the very definition of conditioning. It doesn't match the reality. It's bad reporting. It's bad journalism. But they know what they're doing. They're keeping you from switching that remote. And because of that, we are living in a state of fear. Some people think this is a conspiracy. I don't. That would attribute far too much institutional intelligence to my profession. Uh, but it has the effect of conspiracy. We have to confront that fear. And we need to do that. We, we can't wait for media to change. The news media is not going to change anytime soon. We have to do it ourselves. We have to begin to think in terms of comparative risk. Yes, there is risk out there. I'm not saying there isn't a bear on that stream. There are bad people out there. There's even risk in nature. But there is huge risk in raising future generations under protective house arrest. A risk to their sense of community. Believe it or not, it takes going out the front door to have a sense of community, to discover your neighborhood. A risk to our sense of connection to the earth. A risk to our psychological health, these studies that show this link, a risk to our self sense of efficacy in the future, a risk to our sense of self-confidence, our risk actually of danger when we grow up, when children grow up without much experience outside the house or outside of cyberspace. They are much less aware of what is going on around them when they don't have that experience outside the house. Ultimately, also, this is a terrible risk to their bodies. If we want a real risk that can be counted, we'll look at child obesity. It's skyrocketing, as we all know. The people who have been studying uh, child obesity have come to the conclusion that whatever we're doing, it's not handling the problem. The greatest increase in child obesity in our history occurred during the same two decades as the greatest increase in organized sports for children in our history. Something has been missing from this national conversation. Nature is seldom seen as a word in the literature on child obesity. It's starting to show up. That kind of play that many of us remember when we got home from school and threw our books on the couch and raced outside and we were out there until the street lights came on. Maybe we were playing touch football with our buddies, making it up as we went along, making up new rules. Or if you were like me, you were out in the field, in the woods, etc. That has disappeared largely from childhood. Not everywhere, but largely it has. That has a direct effect on this, uh, that sedentary lifestyle, has a direct effect on our children's health. And that is a risk. Pediatricians are now saying that this generation of children may be the first to have a lower life expectancy than their parents in our history. That's a risk. Um, legally, we need to begin to think in terms of comparative risk. The litigious societies, part, not only are parents terrified of, of strangers, they're terrified of strange lawyers. And I've been talking to a lot of trial lawyers, you know, consumer lawyers, about this and asking them to lead the way to tell us how to change this so that, for instance, that school district that is putting up no running on the uh, signs on the, on the playground is no longer so afraid. Uh, one lawyer, an environmental lawyer in uh, the Bay Area, came up with an interesting idea recently. He thinks that we need a leave no child inside uh, legal defense fund <laughs> uh, in which Attorneys, also insurance companies, others could put money into a foundation, send pro bono lawyers to the rescue, to good parents that have had a, you know, they, they did this sin of letting their kids build a treehouse and they got sued by the community association to actually cherry pick really egregious cases and bring uh, 
intentionally bring uh, media to them and help these folks not settle out of court. And that would send a different message. Let me um, end by uh, talking briefly about something I've thought about a lot since the book came out, which is how we talk to ourselves and how we talk to children, our children, our teenagers, about the future, particularly the future of the environment. Uh, last year, I got back from a trip, and I was asked to go to uh, speak at a high school near where I live, and I didn't want to go. I was tired, and I just got back. Then I started thinking. I wrote this book about kids, and then I started feeling guilty, and so I went. And I expected 20 kids, and there were 200. They were given extra credit. <laughs> uh, and I talked for about an hour, and you could have heard a pin drop. And it's not because I'm a great speaker. I'm not. It was something else. Uh, these kids were really, really paying attention. I was not prepared for this. Uh, and I talked about two things. I talked about the fact that their health, the full use of their senses, psychological health, physical health, has a direct relationship to their experience in nature in a very positive way if they have that experience. Their health, not an abstraction. The second thing I talked about was because of global warming and these climate change, whatever we want to call it, and these huge environmental issues that we do face, because of that, everything in the next 40 years must change. We'll need new kinds of energy. Of course, it's already beginning. We'll need new kinds of agriculture. It's already beginning. We'll need new kinds of urban design. And architecture, it's already beginning with green urbanism and biophilic design. It's already beginning. Be everything must change because of what we face. Now, to a 16-year-old, that's good news. That's, whole new careers will emerge that don't even have a name. Uh, this is an opportunity. Because everything must change, we may be entering the most creative period in hundreds of years of human history because everything must change. How many times, how many generations believe at age 16 that we need a new civilization? My generation believed that. And what have we been telling these kids? We've been telling them, oh, you know, us baby boomers, we tried that, didn't quite work out. We have to change that message. This time we really do need a new civilization. And the enormous creativity that could be unleashed to not only solve the problems, or, ameliorate, or, or, or lessen them, but actually to create a better civilization. We can talk more about that in the Q&A period. But there's great news out there about the kinds of cities, the kinds of schools, the kinds of houses, the kinds of jobs that are going to emerge because everything must change. When the kids left, I turned to the biology teacher and I said, what was that all about? Why were they so attentive? And he said, simple risk, you said something hopeful about the future of the environment, they never hear that. Essentially what they're hearing, they hear other things, but essentially what they're hearing from my profession primarily is that when it comes to the environment, the game's over. Then why would we want to expect them to want to suit up for the game? Surprisingly, they still do, many of them. The truth is, though, that only some people are motivated by despair. The, re the rest of us need something else. In the end, there really isn't any practical alternative to hope. We need to give that to ourselves. We need to be generous with hope to ourselves, to our kids, because it really is the only way out. Not long ago, I was introduced in a speech in Florida by the lieutenant governor, and we were sitting up here. We were talking before that, and at one point she said, Rich, do you think things will ever be as good as they used to be? And when I spoke, I said, you know, the lieutenant governor asked an interesting question, but it's the wrong question. Uh, the right question is how can we make things better than they ever were? If we're not asking that question, we're in big trouble. We need to ask that question. Martin Luther King said in many ways that any movement will fail if it cannot paint a picture of a world that we will want to go to. We have been failing at painting that picture. It is time to paint that picture. 
we can paint that picture. And perhaps the first brush strokes will describe the simple act of each of us taking a child into nature. Thank you. We're going to have a question and answer uh, session here. There's microphones uh, located in the two aisles. And uh, the first question, I'd like to invite a representative from Cold Spring School to uh, come up and ask the question. Can we have a student from Cold Springs come up to ask the first question? Who do you think is really responsible for the cure of nature deficit do you think it is the parents or the schools? Um, well, those are two. Uh, that's a good question. And those are two uh, areas of responsibility. I'm really careful not to put all the blame or responsibility, and I, I don't blame on this one, um, except maybe my profession. Um, I don't place uh, all that much. I don't, I don't want to place all of this burden on parents' shoulders. We already have a lot of guilt. We don't need any more, a lot of sense of guilt. We don't need any more. Um, we are victims, in a sense, of this, too, as parents. But we can do a huge amount. Where there's much that we can do. We can talk about that later. Schools, similar. While schools can do a huge, uh, 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 give a huge gift to this issue, and m some are. I mean, this really is beginning to be talked about a lot more in education circles. I'm, I'm pleased to tell you that there are right now two bills in Congress, one in the House and one in the Senate. Both of them are called the Leave No Child Inside Act. And both are designed to bring nature back into the classroom and get kids back out into nature in the schools. They need help doing that. But the responsibility isn't all theirs either. Uh, What's emerging here really is a partnership among conservation groups, among um, businesses, among gov uh, including government, including schools, including the nature centers, including you know, the, uh, the Eagle Creek uh, Park Foundation, including the Art Museum, which is doing just a wonderful, they're doing some a wonderful thing here. I'm so excited about that. I've not seen what they're doing here elsewhere from an art museum. What we really need is um, uh, what is already happening. There are 40, at least 40 urban regions in the country where very unlikely allies have started to come together and build regional campaigns, regional movements. Sometimes, as in, in, as in Cincinnati, they're called Leave No Child Inside. You, gotta, you know, the naming is tricky. When they first started that, it was called Leave No Child Inside Cincinnati. I would like to ask a question uh, about the um, concept of unstructured play, and I know that in many cases that's a, um, an issue with uh, organizations that deal with children. Well, first, uh, this afternoon I, I talked to someone, I'm sorry I don't remember his name, I think he's here tonight, who's thinking about this in a very deep way in terms of how to create a land trust that you actually can secure that land uh, so that kids can go out and do the kinds of things that we play and that parents won't be afraid. That's going to be really hard to do. But if it can be done here, it could spread all over the country. And I don't know all the details, and he's going to tell me later, but it sounds great. There's a built-in paradox in this issue. It runs all the way through it. And the paradox is that because of the level of fear that parents feel, much more than their kids. Because of that level of, let me pull back on that for a second. At Eagle Creek, uh, par, at, at the park here where I was just at today, they have buses come up from the inner city from kids that get off that bus and believe there are lions and tigers there and are scared. I hear this all over the country. So, you know, I have to add that to the context. Uh, but the, uh, uh, the, the parents are so scared that in order, paradoxically, to give kids some semblance of unorganized play or activity in nature, we're probably going to have to organize a lot of it. 
And it's just going to have to be a paradox we live with and work with with a sense of humor. Um, there are ways to do this. Nature uh, centers, et cetera, are developing techniques to stand back, to allow the child some experience on, you know, on the, the child is in charge of, not some adult hovering over them with nature flat flash cards, you know. Um, truly, it ultimately is about the experience, not the information. The information is very important, but what kids are lacking the most is simply the experience of being in nature just for the joy of it. Um, uh, Rachel Carson said that when introducing a child to nature, the most important thing is not what you know, it's how you feel, your sense of enthusiasm, etc. One of the neat things about this, and by the way, I, I think that because of the fear also, kind of two things need to happen, or three things. One is the information about this new body of evidence, about how great it is for kids, cognitively, psychologically, physically, has to get out there. It is starting to get out there. The second thing is, because of the fear, which is not going to go away, as parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, good adults, we're going to have to be intentional about this. We're going to have to take kids into nature ourselves. That's what I did with my sons. We did a lot of fishing. I had that same sense of fear, even though I knew better. I'd written about those statistics, but when I was raising my kids, they didn't have the kind of freedom I did, right or wrong. But what I did do was be very intentional, and I'm glad I was. Uh, we have to do that. It's not going to happen accidentally. And the third thing that's going to have to happen is we're going to have to give far more uh, financial and moral support to the kinds of institutions and organizations that are helping not only kids but young parents get out into nature and have that free experience, as free as it can be, we have to remember there's a young generation of parents coming up right now that many of them did not have the privilege of that experience. And even when they know how great nature is for kids, they don't know where to start. So they need the institutions and organizations, the scouting organizations, the nature centers, you know, the art museums. Whoever it is in a community that's helping make that happen, we need to help them. During the recent, and actually still going on, Ted Burns World War II um, series, um, he meant, I, we heard twice um, where veterans mentioned their survival came about because of scouts. Yeah. One was first aid, but the other was, you know, the march in Bataan and learning it, knowing about the outdoors and surviving. Yeah. My introduction to the outdoors, my parents' introduction to the outdoors, and my children's was through scouting, boys and girls scouting. Have they lost their impact, or is there something we can do to enable something that's already in effect? Um, well, I'm really supportive of all scouting, uh, whether it's Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts or, or a campfire. It, you know, there's a number of or traditional organizations. Boy Scouts have obviously had some problems politically. Uh, Girl Scouts have not had those problems politically, and yet Girl Scouts, and I make this case in the book, I love the Girl Scouts, but I think... They've been trying to be all things to all people. Mm. Uh, a book agent once told me that a book that is for everyone is for no one. Um, I think there's a great niche market here waiting to be, you know, for, for the scouting to come back to, to really focus on nature. In addition to that, um, I would like to see additional scouting organizations, and there are some emerging or scouting type organizations. I've been talking to John Flicker, the head of National Audubon Society, about this. Now, it could be Audubon, it could be someone else. But Audubon has, a, has, you know, either Audubon directly or the regional Audubons have a huge number of nature centers all across the country, some of which were just museums before, the, but they've moved more toward the experiential. That, I believe, is the vertebrae, set of vertebrae for a new backbone of a new kind of scouting. And I would like to see, whether we call it Audubon or something else, I would like to see a new kind of scouting that, uh, is not age limited, that is from preschool to pre-heaven, <laughs> that, will, that, will, that will recruit many of the people in this room whose hair looks like mine, although they may have more of it. Could I ask quickly? Yeah. You have the idea. What about those of us who might be working with some of those organizations? What do you suggest we could do that might be effective? I, th I think to see this as a great opportunity for 
for recruitment. The, the, um, the, it's interesting the way you, you entered that question, which is about safety. We don't usually think about scouting or those kinds of outdoor, you know, the wilderness programs, et cetera. They are about safety. They are about uh, uh, survival in a sense. And it's not only, you know, knowing how to tie the knot when you're about to <laughs> fall off a cliff. It is also about the awareness of what is around you. It's that story I told about the bears. That can be true in an inner city also, that kind of awareness. It's the physical safety in terms of your physical health. It's your psychological safety in terms of your, your uh, sense of self-confidence and being able to make decisions. The studies do show that being out in nature very much enhances uh, uh, that. Uh, it's interesting, you know, this is, again, my profession. I, a couple of years ago, do you remember the story about the, the scout who got lost? I think it was in Utah. There was a Boy Scout that got lost and was just all over it. It was like three days and nonstop and the ticker tape and all of that. And they finally found him. And it turned out he'd been real close by. And he'd been running away from his rescuers. And the reason is he didn't know them. And his parents had drilled into him that strangers are evil. So it wasn't nature that could have gotten him in the end. It was fear. Thank you very much, uh, Richard, for uh, that insight. And uh, we, have, we have one one more question. Hello. Um, this is more, I guess, a kind of testimony. Um, my name is Anna. I'm a graduate student at IU Bloomington, studying how to promote eco-literacy in early childhood. And for um, four years, I taught at a school in the Bay Area where every Friday the children were allowed six hours to be outside. And um, it was a nature-based um, school, a Waldorf-inspired school. And I had the pleasure of working with the same group of children for four years. And it, is just, it was amazing to see their um, connection deepen, at first from a very magical sense, but then into a really strong sense of connection and stewardship. And I still keep in touch with them now. And um, they're all very involved and all very um, innovative. And they all still have that sparkle in their eyes. And they all, you know, there's this fear that how are they going to do if there's the school, you know, the school is spending so much time with them being in nature, but they're all doing wonderfully academically. And then I also have a question, and um, I'm a parent as well. And um, from being a naturalist, I sometimes allow my son to do some things that people, you know, I let him go surfing when he's four, and sometimes um, people are like, how can you do that? And, you know, when I, how, so what are some ways to address that? Um, well, there that is, fear? interestingly, a lot of social pressure toward parents who let their kids go outdoors these days. After a speech in Florida, a woman came up to me and told me this story. She said that she and her husband had purposely moved to a house that had woods behind them, and they encouraged their kids to go out, put, pitch their tent in the summer, run in and out and to the refrigerator and back out and have fun, you know build forts, all of that radical stuff. And um, a, a, a neighbor, a woman, came to their door one day and knocked on the door and basically accused them of child neglect. And she said, and the, and the mother said, but you don't understand, this is so great for the kids. It's great, you know, for their blah, 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 blah. It's really good for these kids. And the, and the visiting mother says, oh, you're such a liberal. You know, there's a lot of strange definitions of liberal, but that's the strangest yet. Somebody lets their kids go outside and play in the woods in the back of the yard. Um, uh, there is that social. One of the neatest emails I've gotten came right after the book came out. It was from a woman, and there are a lot of parents that are trying to and are doing the right thing. Like me, they're doing it kind of limited compared to what their childhood is, but they're trying. And out of instinct, out of, out of nostalgia, and now they have this new body of evidence. And one of the neatest e emails was from a woman, a mother, and they had made some decisions to get their kids nature. And the subject line was, now I know why I'm doing what I'm doing and why it's right. Let me, let me just end by um, t talking about Indianapolis in this region and the potential here. When I had dinner last night with some of the, some of the leaders and, uh, who, uh, from this area who care about this issue and the ones listed in the program here, um, this region has tremendous sophistication, tremendous ability to move ahead on this issue. It's already happening here. As it becomes more organized, 
you could potentially learn from some of the other cities like Cincinnati and other others and then move ahead of them potentially. I always do this. When I'm in Canada, I tell them, you can do better than the United States, can't you? <laughs> but truly, I mean, you have so much potential here. When an art museum dedicates itself to this issue like that, that tells you something. Um, um, there is something special about this issue that I did not understand when I was writing the book. Uh, I didn't know it was intrinsically hopeful. Uh, I organized, tore up the book, reorganized it, you know, because I didn't really want people slicing their wrist after chapter three. I wanted them to keep reading. So hope is kind of all the way through that. It turns out, though, when I first started going out and uh, talking and people would come to the little book club um, and bookstore things, I realized they weren't leaving depressed. I'm a journalist. I'm used to depressing people. <laughs> and there's some disturbing facts here going on. But they weren't leaving. They were leaving feeling, we can do this. We may feel overwhelmed by so many big problems, but we can do this. And particularly when they understood the huge power in terms of where conservation has come from in the future, the huge power that can be had just by doing this simple act. The second thing is, it is not a simple act. It may be a simple act to do, but it is not a simple act in its impact. Um, I have learned that it doesn't matter what somebody's politics or religion is. They always want to tell me about the treehouse or that special place in the woods that still exists in their heart. If they're old enough to have had that experience. The, this issue has gotten support literally from the Sierra Club to the 700 Club. I was on the 700 Club a few weeks ago. I never thought I'd be on the 700 Club. <laughs> um, the religious uh, community has come to support this um, of all kinds, liberal, conservative, I think that smart religious people understand intuitively that all spiritual life begins with a sense of wonder. We can remember that when we were three or four, perhaps, out in the backyard, climb, you know, crawling along on hands and knees and turning over a rock and finding for the first time that we were not alone in the universe. And that sense of awe and wonder, listening to wind and trees when we were that age. We cannot shut that window. Um, politically, I was giving testimony. I was asked to give testimony twice in Congress, and the first time I could make it. And it, this was the uh, Interior uh, Appropriations Subcommittee. And six congressmen came. I'm told that's a big turnout. Uh, but it was very interesting watching this process. Uh, afterwards, all the, you know, they wouldn't let go. All these six men. All they wanted to talk about was that place in their heart that still exists, how it was when they were a kid. And they had that same sense that that rancher that I described, it, that same sense that we cannot be the last generation or one of the last generations to have that kind of sense of attachment to land and to nature. In those moments, there were no Democrats in the room. There were no Republicans. The Secretary of the Interior, Dirk Kempthorne, the new one, he has adopted this as his most important issue. He carries, I was told this by a lot of people, and then I actually saw it. He carries around a battered copy of Last Child in the Woods. He asked me to talk to the 300 top managers in the entire inter interior department. I did. They gave me a standing ovation. It helps to have the boss endorse you. Um, uh, and then he said to them all, I want you to go today in this room, go, go figure out what the entire Department of Interior can do in all of its departments to connect kids to nature, and a lot is going to come from that. I've heard about some things. Uh, the U.S. Forest uh, Service, and it goes uh, on and on. Even developers, as I mentioned. Not long after the book came out, a developer wrote me an email and said he just finished the book. He was profoundly disturbed by it, he said. Now, I pulled out a lot of stakes, so I was ready for that. Um, but then he went on. He says, I want to do something about this. And he had me to an envisioning session in Phoenix. There were about 80 developers and real estate marketers in the room. I gave my sermonette. I got ready to run. Then he turns to them and he says, I want you all to go into small groups. I want you to solve the problem. How are we going to build developments in the future that actually connect kids to nature? The room filled with noise, happy noise. These are developers, happy noise. 
they came back. They started reporting their ideas. Some of them were really practical and good, like leave some land in the first place. Good place to start. But then they had a bunch of other ideas about, about nature centers on that land and tra nature trails and all that. And they, many of them now are starting to see this as a real marketing uh, uh, thing. And I, as I did at the Eastwood thing, I really emphasize that I hope in their creation, in helping create this new civilization that I was talking about, that they focus not just on the edges of the cities, but on the crumbling second and third rung suburbs and all of those redundant shopping centers. What if they were replaced with the kind of eco-towns that I just visited in the Netherlands that have more density and more nature? What if we rebuilt our civilization to inform everywhere we live and everywhere we work with nature? The people who design these buildings, by the way, some of them are no longer calling them green buildings, they're calling them high-performance high buildings, and it's not because of the performance of the energy. The old defini definition, it seems to me, of, of green urbanism was all about efficiency. Got to do that, got to save that energy, ultimately kind of boring, eat your peas, got to do that. But the new definition, and they're finding this out, the people who work in buildings that have nature in the design from the beginning and then kept there are more productive, Sick time goes down, turnover gets better, et cetera, et cetera. That's high productivity. That's creating a world that is even better than the one we're in. That's ultimately where this issue leads us, whether it's education or the developments that are being built, the redesign of our cities, uh, the redesign of environmentalism itself. This is not just about the restoration of nature. This is about the restoration of humans. It is about human restoration through nature. That's the great work. The Indianapolis could be one of the leading regions in accomplishing. I sensed that last night when we had dinner. I sense that now. You have great leadership here. You have great institutions already. Uh, I would hope that you do lead this, this movement. Thanks. Thank you, Richard. Uh, we're gathered here tonight in the uh, uh, Deer Zinc Pavilion. Uh, first of all, Wayne, thanks for the use of the room. Uh, but I would uh, like to call up Wayne Zinc, who is the CEO of Endangered Species Chocolate Company, to uh, give us a few final words. I know we're going a little longer than before, but I think uh, Wayne can keep the lights on for a, a couple more minutes. So. Wayne, please come on up. Wow. Um, so in the program, it's listed that I will give a response. My response is thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Profound, moving, um, amazing. Those of you who know me know that the place I go in my heart is Brown County. Randy Deer and I have a home there, and it's very, very special to us. And that is the place where our family had an epiphany. And the epiphany is we want to invest in Indianapolis, and we want to support this museum because art and nature are very linked. And I think that, Richard, is why this museum is so invested in nature and so invested in helping youth and our culture here understand how nature touches them. So I want to tell you two personal stories. I do a little bit of volunteer work sometimes at Jameson Camp. Many of you know about Jameson Camp. It's a treasure. It's a hundred acres of beautiful green space in our city. And for those of you who want to experience what it's like to see what nature can do for a child, experience Jameson Camp. So I was out there volunteering. Um, I run Endangered Species, Species Chocolate, and I have a master's in counseling. Go figure. I don't, you know. So I'm out there volunteering, using my master's in counseling. And there's always this moment. There is a moment when the child steps off the bus, 
and looks at the hundred acres. And it's kind of like this. And sometimes it takes three days for that child to understand the idea of space, the idea of flowing water, the idea of what grass feels like when it's moist. At first, I was very excited by that experience. And then I became profoundly troubled because I realized these children right here in our community were touching earth like that for the first time. So more work for us to do. Now I want to link nature and art and explain why my family, my little family, supports this museum. That same group that year from Jameson Camp came here. And I volunteer for um, a camp called Tataya Mato. And Tataya Mato at Jameson Camp works with children who have in some way been affected by HIV. It's a beautiful camp. It's intensive. It's 10 days. It's 24-7. And these volunteers give their hearts and their lives to helping these children. It's amazing. So we came here with a group of children and a young girl, 10 years old, who I'd happened to work with three consecutive years, so I knew her, was standing in front of a beautiful work, if you haven't seen it, of Bill Viola, upstairs here in the Contemporary Gallery. And while standing in front of the Bill Viola, which is a piece that speaks, it's, it's a movement piece, it's a video piece, and it, spe- it has five men expressing five emotions, depression, anger, fear. She was standing in front of this Bill Viola, quiet and silent for 30 seconds, so I'm watching, and then 90 seconds became concerned, she's 10, and was very still in front of the Bill Viola, and I walked up, and I said, what's up? And I looked at her, and she had tears running down her eyes, and she said, that's how I feel. That's how I feel. The art allowed her to understand the pain she was experiencing because of uh, HIV present in her life. So in the same breath, we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity right here in this community to use nature and to use art to help the children. And Richard is right. We have tremendous leadership, and we are blessed. So I want to thank Richard, and I want to take a moment to thank the IMA and to thank Linda Duke, and please a round of applause. This is her brainchild, and she does so much. Marsha Oliver, um, and thank you. And thank you for coming tonight. Um, We're a lucky community. Thank you.